And you may be seated. So we're all, uh, we're all here together this morning, and I, I've got a question that I want to ask you guys. How many of you appreciate fairness? Come on, let me see your hand. You like things to be fair. This is what I've noticed about fairness in my own life. I've noticed that I don't complain about things being unfair unless they're unfair against me. Have you ever noticed that? I, like, I, don't, I don't complain unless that unfairness diminishes me in some way, unless I'm disadvantaged by it. Growing up, there were, uh, there were four kids in, uh, in, in our family. And, uh, and so, you know, four boys and then my sister. And we would fight over food all the time. And, uh, and there was many a time when we would say, unfair, unfair. I mean, they got the bigger portion. And my, uh, my mom, getting tired of that, perhaps with the wisdom of Solomon, said, why don't you uh, do this? One of you split it and the other chooses. Have you ever had that happen? And, uh, and so we would, when it was our turn to split, we would with surgical precision make sure that that piece was perfect, right? And you know, this idea of, of unfairness has kind of traveled with me even into my adult life. Because, you know, sometimes I'll be driving down the highway and there will be like five cars going at least 10 miles an hour faster than me. And then I get pulled over. Are you kidding me? Is that fair? But what happens when fairness works to our advantage? When, when something is unfair to our good? What do we do with that? You know what I call that? Answered prayer. <laughs> Truly. I, I mean, what do you do when something happens in your life that is unfair to your advantage? What do you do? Do you leave it alone and say, oh no, that's not fair? Of course not, you're just like me. You thank God for it and walk on as fast as possible before somebody changes their mind. Like, you know what, when we were kids in the house, you know, we never said, unfair, our piece is too big. My kids have never said, unfair, I got to drive shotgun last time. It's never happened. So when we think about this idea of fairness, well, I think we're all a little bit selective, aren't we? Fairness. But if you were to ask the average person what Christianity is, if you were to ask the average person to boil it all down and tell you, you know, what they think Christianity is all about, I think that the majority of people would say it's about fairness. You see, good people go to heaven and bad people don't. That's fair. And that's the way the majority of people feel Christianity is. It's basically about fairness. But do you want God to be exactly fair with you? Honestly, when you do a moral inventory of your own life, when you, when you do a little kind of history and, and, and think about all the things that you've done and all the things that you've said and, and, uh, and all of the misbehavior in your life, do you want God to treat you exactly the way you deserve? I don't think so. What I want to share with you today is that the kingdom of God is not about fairness. In fact, what we celebrate here this morning is that the kingdom of God is extremely unfair. In fact, I could say it like this. It is scandalously unfair to our good. And to share that with you here this morning, to drive that point home, I wanna tell you a story. It's perhaps the most scandalous story in the entire Bible. And so what i like for you to do, if you don't mind, is for you just to use your imagination and, uh, and just kind of pretend that I'm in your living room and we're just gonna talk, have a little cup of coffee. I know you'll have to use your imagination because if this is your living room, I want to see the rest of your house. And, and we're probably, you know, not going to have the choir in the living room. And certainly I'm not going to have a suit on in your living room. 
In fact, the only reason I've got a suit on today is because Laura said I had to. It's Easter, like one time a year. Come on. But I'm going to tell you a story. And I've wanted to tell this story for the last couple of years. I'll be honest. Because this story is so magnificently good. Unfair, I grant you but unfair to our good that I think it celebrates what we celebrate this weekend better than any other story. I'm gonna tell you the story about a man. And you know what? We're not gonna know much about this man. Some stories that you hear, you, you get the whole experience of his life or her life. You get to know where they were born, you get to know their parents, you get to know you know, perhaps they're siblings. You certainly know about some of the challenges and heartaches and maybe some of the accomplishments and, and, and you get the whole picture. But this is not a story like that. This is a story where we're just going to get the last few sentences in the last paragraph on the last page of the last chapter of his life. We don't know how old this man was. Maybe he lived for 30 years, maybe 40 years. And what we're going to get in this story is just the last few minutes of his life. But what happens in the last few minutes of his life are so powerful and so scandalously unfair that whenever the gospel has been preached, this story has been included. The context of this story happens along with the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. And the story unfolds in the 23rd chapter of Luke. So I'll pick it up right here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. You know, the Bible doesn't even give him a name. He's just a criminal going to be executed alongside Jesus. You know, the Bible doesn't give him a name, but church history does. They named him Demas. So we'll just continue with that name. The man who has no name we'll call Demas. We don't know why he chose a life of crime. Maybe he came from a bad family. Maybe he wasn't raised very well. Maybe he was abused. Maybe he was left orphaned. Maybe he was just fighting for his own existence in the poverty of his time. And so he turned to a path of criminal behavior. Or maybe he came from a good family because you know what? We all know that even though you might be raised right, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of your decisions will be right. And maybe he just got on with the wrong crowd and decided to do some things that weren't right. We don't know. But we do know this, don't we? That all of us have gone bad in some form or fashion ourselves, don't we? The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. We know what that feels like. So here is a, a man who's going to be executed next to Jesus. You know what's kind of interesting about this is, is that normally the Roman Empire would not execute criminals. Normally they would chain them to a galley and make them row their warships. So the fact that this man was being executed tells you something about him. We know he wasn't a political idealist that was you know, inciting rebellion and insurrection. We know he wasn't a slave because the Bible tells us he's a criminal but he must have been such a bad criminal that the Roman Empire thought it better to execute him than to use him in one of their galley ships. He must have committed crimes so heinous that they needed to get rid of him. That's the story of this man. In verse 23, and when they came to a place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, 
one on his right and the other on his left. I don't know what you think about when you think about the crucifixion. I, I don't know what kind of picture comes to your mind, but I, I think about that hill and I think about it being dark. And I think about perhaps hundreds, if not thousands of people that are, that are around the hillside. Do you know who was in that crowd that day? There were some who were followers and friends of Jesus in that crowd. And then there were also probably a large amount of curiosity seekers, those who were just there to, to see what would unfold because they probably heard a lot about Jesus leading up to this moment. And there were also probably in that crowd some of the religious folks and the Pharisees and of course the Roman soldiers as well. All of the voices that the Bible records of what took place on that particular day 2,000 years ago from the crowd were voices of mocking. We have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, and they were hurling up to Jesus these kind of taunts. You know what? You saved others. Why don't you save yourself? The Roman soldiers, they were taunting as well. They were saying, if you're the Christ, if you're the Son of God, come on, save yourself. Even the other thief on the cross said, come on, Jesus, save us, save yourself, mocking. Darkness, clouds, wind, taunts of mocking, and then one voice above the whole crowd, just one voice is raised to defend Jesus. And you might be in that crowd that day, and one voice is speaking on behalf of Jesus, and you might wonder, who is this person? You probably would have thought logically that the person who would defend Jesus in that moment must have been somebody who heard Jesus talk on the side of the mountain when Jesus was eloquently talking about what the kingdom of God was like, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Somebody that was in that sermon, that must be the person who's defending him. Or maybe it was the one who Jesus healed. Maybe it was like blind Bartimaeus. You know, maybe it was the, the lame man who is now walking. Maybe it was, uh, you know, the, uh, the deaf man who is now hearing. Maybe that person whose life was so transformed by the touch of Jesus, now when he sees Jesus on the cross, he says, I gotta defend him. Maybe it was that person. Or, or maybe it was the woman who was caught in adultery. Or maybe it was Lazarus, who he just raised from the dead, his friend. Certainly his friend Lazarus would defend him, wouldn't he? Or maybe it was one of his disciples that I know they ran away in the, in the garden, but maybe they gathered around the cross and, and maybe one of them, like Peter or James or John, found the courage to defend Jesus when he was on the cross. Is it one of them? No. It's not any of them. In fact, the only voice that defends Jesus comes from the most unlikely of places a criminal who is being crucified right beside him. And what he says has such clarity and power to it. Listen to what this criminal said. He said, don't you fear God? I mean, I find this amazing that this criminal that, that never went to seminary, that never went to the synagogue, that, that never went to church, never went to shoreline, north or south or east or west. He knows when perhaps no one else around him knows, he knows that God is doing something. Don't you fear God. He knows that God is up to something. Listen to what he says. With clarity that most people never possess. 
He says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. You know what, most people don't have that kind of awareness. Most people think, you know what, I'm okay, you're okay. They don't understand that they're really guilty. But this man did. He's saying, we're getting what we deserve. And then the third thing he says, he says, but this man has done nothing wrong. He's saying, you know what? This person who's dying doesn't deserve to die. This criminal that never went to church and never went to seminary knew that God was up to something, knew that he was guilty, and knew that somebody was dying that didn't deserve to die. Now this criminal that's on this cross, he's under no illusions. He knows that there is no way that he did enough good in his life to merit paradise. The only hope he has, if he has any hope at all, is to receive some mercy and some grace. This precious mercy and grace that he gave very little of to others in his life. What this man needs is mercy and grace. 